It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Okay, real quick, some questions for you. What if baseball teams only played once a week? What if Title IX never was? Or if basketball rims were smaller than basketballs? These are excellent questions. You don't need to be a sports fan to see that. And good news, they're all answered in a new book, Upon Further Review, The Greatest What-Ifs in Sports History. It's a collection of essays from over 30 different writers, people ranging from Robert Siegel to Nate DeMeo to Jesse Eisenberg and more, all asking, then answering thoughtfully, hypothetical questions about sports that range from the trivial to the existential. The book was compiled by Mike Pesca, and if you know who Mike Pesca is, that won't surprise you. He's a sports nut, obviously, a lifelong Jets, Mets, and Knicks fan who called into his first sports talk show at 10 years old. He was a sports reporter here at NPR for a long time. He still contributes every now and then. He also hosts The Gist, a daily podcast over at Slate, where he covers the news of the day. But more importantly, Mike Pesca is a man who loves arguing over a good hypothetical, really teasing it out exploring every possible outcome. So, if you're a writer and you've been thinking to yourself, what would happen if football had been deemed too boring in 1899? There's literally no one better to take it up with than Mike Pesca. Let's get into the interview. Mike Pesca, welcome to Bullseye. It's great to have you back on the show. It's been a long time. Back. Back. Was I bat? Was I here when it was Bullseye? I don't know. Well, maybe not when it was Bullseye. Certainly when it was right. The Sound of Young America in the olden yeah. days. And I'm Ooh, uh, spanning gr- the eras. And I'm grateful to get to talk to you again on the show. I'm going to give you the ultimate softball question of all softball questions, Mike. Why did you want to write a book about uh, what ifs in sports history? So... As you know, I I covered sports for about seven years for NPR, and I would go to the World Series and the Super Bowl and World Cups and things like that, and there'd be confetti and a winner. And I got to reflecting on my own sports fandom, which includes New York teams, Jets, Mets, and St. John's. And in the course of my entire life, my teams have won one championship. (laughs) And as as I was sitting there with the confetti, I got to say, it did occur to me, what if my teams had won. And that is a sort of cheap reverie that that can instill. But as I got to thinking about it more, I, f- I figured that if we imp- if we applied some structure to the question, because usually what if just means if only, you know, if only this guy hadn't gotten hurt or that referee hadn't blown the call, then our team would have won championships. But if we applied some structure and some rules, we went from if only, and I, I can't believe my team has, you know, blown eight drafts in a row to what I think are 31 interesting chapters for everyone to consider that include things like rippling throughout history and history lessons or just, you know, flat out funny bits of whimsy. So that's how it started and that's how it finished. Is this just a function of the fact that you enjoy arguing? I do enjoy I do enjoy a debate. And so a lot of these can be, a lot of the essays, I think, are great versions of a thesis pursued. You know, Ben Lindbergh, busting out the charts on what if baseball had tested for steroids, you know, in 1991. And after you read that, you f- you would say to yourself, that clearly is what would have happened. Um, others are things that you didn't ever think about, like Jason Gay writing, what if football were deemed too boring in 1899? It's like, well, w- w- was that possible? Turns out it was. It was a very boring sport, also a deadly sport. Kind of interesting that you could have both a lot of deaths and Theodore Roosevelt had to intervene to stop the bloodshed, but also incredibly boring. When you say a lot of deaths, I mean like literally a lot of people died on the football field each year. Yes. Dozens. Yes. That's right. And it got to the president's attention, who, because he was a a hell fellow, well met and believed in the manly pursuits, he wanted to save football. And essentially, he created the NCAA and we have football as a result. But I don't know that that was a debate. Right. So I don't think there's a debate over what if football were deemed too boring. That's just a flight of fancy or come with me along this journey as I tease out the implications to to this thing you probably haven't ever thought about. And then the second to last 
last chapter in the book is Claude Johnson writing, what if Nat Sweetwater Clifton's pass had not gone awry in like 1947? Definitely not something I'd <laughs> ever even considered because I didn't know what happened. So that's using a what if to tell us a history lesson, which is about something I had never known, which is the essentially the integration of the NBA. Before there was an NBA, there were these great barnstorming African-American basketball teams. We know the Harlem Globetrotters, the Harlem Wrens were even better. And they all got together with the white teams and all the other teams in this like huge basketball jamboree. And from there, the greatest team was named. Claude Johnson runs a foundation that studies this era in history. And I was just happy to have, you know, found a way to get this history lesson in my book. Were there things that you had on a notepad that you thought, I'm going to find somebody for these ones because these ones are things that I think about all the time? Yes. I don't know about all the time. I think that because I uh, I have the GIST podcast and because I have all the, you know, there's a lot occupying my mental space. Sometimes you're reading the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Well, you know this. You have you have a few outlets. And so I would imagine, well, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Like, do you just randomly think of ideas and then say, ah, this can go in that show or this can go in the other show? Or do you kind of start thinking about a show and then generating ideas for the show? Mike, you you presume that I think. Yes. <laughs> so to answer your question, what I really did was I contacted smart people who'd write good chapters. And I said to them, hey, Robert Siegel, what do you want to do? Hey, uh, Stefan Fatsis, what do you want to do? And I got about 15 to 17 chapters that way. And then I began backfilling it with, well, we need a good hockey chapter. Katie Baker is a great writer. Want to write about Wayne Gretzky? The answer is yes. And then with so- sometimes it was just serendipity. I kind of thought Nate DeMeo, uh, who does the memory Memory Palace podcast would be good to write a chapter because I know he's very funny and I know he wrote the the book about Pawnee, the fake history of Parks and Rec. And so he's very good with fooling people into thinking that this thing that didn't happen really did. So <laughs> on a lark, I gave I gave him a call and DeMeo said, what if the Olympics had never dropped tug of war? And I literally said, I've never thought of that, but clearly you have. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the topic that surprised you the most? I would say it's the the chapter on the Nat Sweetwater Clifton because I had never even known that this huge uh, dra- basketball jamboree had ever existed and the implications of it. But then, I don't know if you know John Boyce from SB Nation. He's just a brilliantly insane, funny guy. So I would say it was surprising when he when I said, would you like to write a chapter? And then maybe a day and a half later, he gave me this fully formed chapter. And it was, what if the basketball rims were smaller than the basketball? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like uh, it would I, be problematic, Mike. Well, um, every game in the history of the league has ended in a 0-0 tie, <laughs> except the one that he uh, provides the expansive... TBS transcript for uh, the game, the one game where there was a goaltending. I don't want to ruin things, but let's just say Reggie Miller is as pedantic if the ball can't go in as if the ball could. <laughs> I enjoyed reading about my favorite basketball team, the Golden State Warriors, a team which I hasten to point out because it's 2018, has been my favorite basketball team since the late 1980s. Traveling in time to face the great teams of the past. Yes. Can you tell me about that thought experiment? Mm Mm-hmm. So this was the last chapter added to the book. And let me tell you what occasioned this chapter. It was the fact that the Golden State Warriors are great and we'd like to try to quantify how much greatness they have within them. But more the proximate cause, as the historians might say, was that Ethan Sherwood Strauss was fired by ESPN. There was this round of firings and I immediately said, terrible for Ethan, horrible for sports writing in general. Uh, Warriors coach Steve Kerr actually weighed in opining that ESPN was stupid to fire Ethan. But since Ethan was now a free agent, if I, if I learn nothing else from sports, got to pick up the free agents when they're on the market. I said, Ethan, would you like to do this? And the great thing about that chapter is it's not a very, ner- well, it's 
sufficiently nerdy for as a basketball chapter. If you love basketball, it's you would you would really get off on the fact that when the the Warriors, the current Warriors, go back to play Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls, he really takes into account the different way rules were enforced at the time, roster construction, what we thought of the three point line. So definitely the basketball nerds are serviced. But if you're a sci fi fan, there's a lot of details in good. There's a lot of details in there. It works well as a sci fi chapter. Yeah, I mean he really writes the looper or primer of. <laughs> basketball <laughs> fandom yeah pretty much uh now by the way i happen to know that even though the golden state warriors are your favorite team probably when they were terrible basketball wasn't your favorite pursuit <laughs> now probably it is <laughs> mike what was it like to be one of the what is it two sports reporters at npr yeah well my, I was the second one to join, and that really uh, doubled the sports department. So that really, <laughs> really increased our brief. Um, Tom Goldman being the other one. It was great because pretty quickly I learned to understand the audience and how to communicate with the audience in a way that gave me pleasure and them pleasure. And the two um, rules I had were well, they always say in radio to talk to one person, have a, have a listener in mind. And that's nice in the abstract, but I don't know if anyone really does it, but I literally did it. I thought of my high school friend, Jason Whitney, who loves sports and would not want to be bored uh, by listening to NPR and hearing stuff that he already knew and hearing phrases like the three-point line in basketball, which confers three points upon a made basket. And literally early on, one editor who wound up not being my actual editor said that I need to define what the three point line was. So this is where we were. But I thought of this guy and I thought of, I will never bore him with a sport sports report. But then I also thought of my NPR listening cousins who care nothing about sports. And I said, and I will always interest her with my sports report. Now, how do you do both those things? I had some tricks. I had some techniques, but that's what I always tried to do with a sports report. And it's very easy to say on NPR, you know, the audience isn't a sports audience. It's okay if you slow down and hold their hand. You don't want to lose them. I guess, but that really, I think, gives you too much slack and too much leeway to disappoint the person in the audience who is a sports fan. So the way to do sports on NPR is a little is definitely different from the way to do sports on ESPN, but it's not just taking out the jargon or the advanced statistics. It's not just the Olympics technique of telling a gauzy, feel-good story about the person. There are a lot of other ways that the NPR audience really responds to sports. Does sports belong on NPR? Definitely, because they're a very important thing in society. They're a glimpse into, uh, into well, they're a passion of people. They are a great metaphor. And the other reason is, just from a real practical standpoint, you can have two hours of ATC, all things considered, and just, just never-ending, relentless downers of stories. And then there comes three and a half minutes where something exciting and interesting and newsworthy and nonfiction happens, and it is such a respite. I found that my reports were really valued um, in the days when people would only listen to All Things Considered a Morning Edition as a radio show. So the concept was you were getting however long your listening period was, but it could be up to two hours, it could be 45 minutes, and people and so you would program the show to have different programmatic elements. And the element that I offered with Sports Report was just different. It wasn't always uplifting. It could be a very serious report, but it was just different in tone in, this, in the same way that, you know, so sometimes it might be a sorbet. Sometimes it might be a salsa. Sometimes it might be just, you know, a different cut of meat than what was being served all the time. And that's really important if you're programming an interesting and diverse radio show. Why don't you work at NPR anymore? Um, I loved working at NPR, and it was very satisfying to have that huge audience. But I would uh, I felt I was a little bit underused. I don't know if I was underappreciated. I had so many friends from NPR, and I felt the bosses definitely liked me. But, you know, there were just more things that I wanted to and could say that were off the beat of sports. I could have changed my beat and reported on 
um, I don't know, some, you know, uh, water usage in the West, okay, then I would have definitely quit. But I could have, I could have changed my beat, but then I'd have to report on that beat. I suppose I could become a general assignment reporter in New York, but it was all still limiting. And then I went to this show, The Gist. I created this show. I just talk about the two or three things. I do an interview every show, and I talk about two or three things that are occurring to me every show. One's a short thing, and then at the end's a long thing, which is called the spiel, which would be considered a column if it were in a newspaper or a host piece if it were on the radio. I didn't know if I could generate enough uh, ideas for this. I found out after doing it for now over a thousand episodes, that's not the problem. It's not actually generating the ideas. It's focusing the ideas and executing the ideas. So I was having all these ideas that were going no place. So I found a way to uh, create a place for all these ideas and thoughts to go. Do you listen to talk radio outside of public radio style talk radio? Yeah, but on podcasts. Um, I don't really listen over the air too much, but I seek out the stuff that's over the air on podcasts. Sometimes I think that folks that I meet in the public radio world haven't really heard hot talk or sports talk or even non-public radio news talk. Yeah, I get that impression. I mean, I think it's true. Like, I would... uh... I would sometimes make a reference to, not Rush Limbaugh, he's known, but people who dominate the local markets to uh, other public radio people in the market, and they've never heard of them. And that's strange to me. And I'm not even talking about sports radio. I'm talking about a guy like John Montone on the New York uh, WINS, the give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. And... You know, I would talk to a news person. I said, oh, yeah, that's like a John Montone story. And they'd be like, what? I'm like, don't you understand? He has five times the listeners you do. <laughs> He's affecting the conversation much more than he than we are. I want to play a clip of you. And this is not from your show, The Gist, uh, which is a wonderful show that you do for Slate. This is you guest hosting an NPR show a couple of years ago. Oh, gosh. (laughs) And the NPR show in question is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the wonderful news quiz show ordinarily hosted by Peter Sagal. Um, And you're doing a guest interview. So the first thing I want to do, and I know you're here to talk about your book about selfies, but the first thing I want to do is I think the biggest thing in your life, I hear that you and your husband, Kanye West, are expecting your second child, and can the reports be confirmed? Is it a boy? We actually haven't told anyone the sex. So I heard that we're having a boy. I heard that we're having twins. I heard that I'm not even carrying my own baby. I've heard so many (laughs) things, and most of the information is not true. Okay. Well, if anyone needs their privacy respected. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That was Kim Kardashian West, of course, uh, the reality television star and empresaria. I have to say, I didn't catch this live. I listened to it later that week, and I thought she was uh, delightful. Charming. Totally charming. You're like, okay, that's why she's so successful. She's good at this. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Um, what was the reaction that you and Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me got from that interview? (laughs) Yes. So the guest was charming. And let's also put into context for the six listeners who don't know, what kind of show is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me? Oh, it's a light (laughs) entertainment program. (laughs) Right, right. So it is not tasked with breaking down the uh, Korean missile talks. No, Um, although I'm sure Paula Poundstone would have something uh, amusing to say about the uh, Korean missile talks at any given time. I, I mean, I hope she's tabbed to be a negotiator. So <laughs> That may end I, up happening, Mike. <laughs> yes. I would I would describe the reaction as a deluge of of muck. I mean, NPR, and this was, I think, at a time when the comment sections were open and people would write in just in conventional, I, I suppose, quill pens to parchment. It seemed that no one liked that interview, that they were upset that this is not what we turn to NPR for. And there was a little bit of a backlash to that. But man, was NPR slammed, was Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me slammed for infecting the ears of listeners for the eight minutes of that very pleasant and funny purpose of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me to be funny, funny interview. Yeah, it wasn't. They they didn't like it. How did you feel about that at the time? Uh, I kind of like that they didn't like it because... (laughs) (laughs) Just because it's not your show? 
Yeah, it's not my. I love to ruin things and then move on. I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. I remember reading this. Th- there was this guy who used to do uh, audience surveys about NPR, and he uh, he created like a lot of these consultants will create these categories. Why do people listen to NPR? And one is the news gatherer, and one is the um, facilitator. But there is a category: the monk. And what the monk uses NPR for is to shut out the. Uh, vicissitudes of the outside world. The NPR is a oasis from being sullied by the culture. And I think we were hearing from the loudest and nastiest of the monks. And don't think that NPR doesn't have loud, nasty people within its uh, very, very polite confines. It does. Um, And and we kind of struck at People have a real relationship with NPR, and some of those people, that relationship is part of their identity, and we kind of force them into listening for seven or eight minutes the totemic antithesis of what their identity was, and they didn't like it, and they didn't know how to process it, and also I think the monk is much more likely to write letters. So that was one reason why I think that was one phenomenon that was going on. But another was I liked that people got so upset because I think in our culture, everything is just that that phrase, oh, it's all good. And there's no tension or pushback in terms of pop culture and what is right and what is wrong. I read this review of Groucho Marx once and he said, now everyone's the Marx brothers. It's just that we've run out of Margot Dumont's. And so I kind of like the idea that out there, there are still these kind of persnickety blue noses so that once you do something, quote unquote, transgressive, it actually does transgress, right? It's not like experimental theater, which is supposed to confront the audience. But of course, everyone who bought a ticket wants some version of the audience that doesn't exist to be confronted. So I like that. I like that they hate Kim Kardashian and hated me for interviewing her. Mike, can I ask you about your manner of speech? Yes. So ordinarily, the type of talking that generates complaints in public radio and in my experience in podcasting as well is uh, aspirated vowels Uh and up talk, things that people associate with young women. Right. Vocal fry, in other words. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. Right. But you do have a regional accent. Yeah. You talk like a guy from the New York, New Jersey area because, spoiler alert, you're a guy from the New York, New Jersey area. (laughs) That's true. Why is it so unusual for someone who hosted a program in public radio to have a regional accent? And I say that as a dude who, because I'm from San Francisco and have one parent from the East Coast and one parent from the Midwest, I have... Uh, an accent that only a linguist would recognize as a as a regional accent. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that some are more countenanced. I mean, okay, I don't know if it, Wade Goodwin's accent is celebrated or Wade's booming baritone is celebrated or just Wade is celebrated, but if anyone would ever complain about the way Wade Goodwin speaks, them's fighting words. I think El- <laughs> Eleanor Eleanor Beardsley, maybe it's the fact that she brings a little Southern twang to her beat in France. That seems to not be a problem to anyone. I do think it's that the New York accent is seen as less intelligent. The same kind of person that, so is the Southern accent. I'll say that too, but maybe there's something also authentic about the Southern accent that a, people feel more snobbish if they put it down. Whereas the New York accent, I don't know, maybe strikes people as unintelligent or less evolved, the people who want to use public radio as an escape. That's why in my life, I've been slowly assembling a list of extremely intelligent people with thick New York accents, or at least very discernible New York accents, Mario Cuomo, Pete Hamill. I've got a list of these guys who talk like New Yorkers, you know. Denzel Washington's on that list, and Spike Lee is too. They, they have a specific kind of accent that's very New York. So I love those kind of accents. I would discount the people who, you know, uh, chafe against it. But the other thing I'd say about that is 
I have talked to women. They say that, you know, women only women's voices are policed many many women who i uh talk to who are podcasters will say i'm always getting letters from guys talking about the how high my voice is or the vocal fry or the up talk and only women are policed in this manner i will say this women are stupidly policed in that manner but on my show one time i read 15 emails from listeners essentially saying take this marble mouth guy off the air he can't talk uh drown him in the guanas canal <laughs> <laughs> mike i'm glad you have that list of smart people with heavy new york accents it complements my 15 minute clip reel of Smart people who I admire using the word hella. <laughs> How do you make time in your life for the media consumption you have to do to do a daily program? That's my job. I did think, you know, when I was a sports reporter, I would, of course, still read at least one paper. And I did think, well, I'm doing this anyway, but I... I'm not going to say force myself. It's it's a pleasure and I'm interested in the news, but it is my job. So I put, you know, the news in front of me. There are times when I'm reading through the paper or reading um, the foreign policy flashpoints memo or the uh, Brookings three big ideas of the day where it, or Walt Hickey's numlock or some other source where I could that could spark an idea which is interesting and they do it does spark ideas but I do tell myself you know if I didn't have this show if I didn't have this beast to feed I probably wouldn't be reading you know six um six newsletters a day maybe we'd be down to two I mean you have a family to take care of Mike yeah well you know they're free range at this point do you still have an oil <laughs> painting of your dog in your office <laughs> Rummy he's uh uh, it's a little sensitive, but that's the one uh, actual physical uh, point of disagreement in the divorce. Oh. We're actually literally wrangling over that. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Bullseye. Uh, it's always great to get to talk to you, and I, I love and admire your work so much. Well, uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jesse. I normally say you're welcome, but I really mean it. Thank you for having me. Mike Pesca. Upon Further Review is out now. It's a really fun read. Go pick it up. You can listen to Mike every weekday on Slate's The Gist podcast, too. It is fun, funny, and really enlightening. Mike is a genuinely brilliant guy. <laughs>